<laughs> so I'm very sorry about the delay because uh, the prayer song was going on. So there was, oh. we were not able to begin. Now we can begin. We welcome you, sir. Most oh, happy. thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, am I talking to Professor Anju Borki? <laughs> Oh. No, you were not talking to Anshuvarthi. You were talking to Rosanna Davis. Hi, hi, Professor. Um, so, so I'm going to start. Um, please feel free to interrupt me. Raise, raise your hand if you have questions, or um, just step up to the mic and speak. Uh, I'm going to present your syllabus. Is, can you all see your syllabus? Yes, sir. Okay. So, looks like you are reading Shakespeare's Hamlet, Tempest, Henry the Fourth, Part One, Marlowe's Doctor Faustus, Thomas Kidd, etc. Um, and I see Utopia. Um, so what I will do is offer a general introduction the discipline of Renaissance literary studies. And as we progress, I will try to touch on as many of the uh, literary texts listed there. Um, I have not read uh, a number of them in recent years. Um, the way we run our classes um, on our campuses, we'll, students would read the book in advance and we'll just sit around and just uh, chat about it. I usually don't say much. They, they talk. I ask a few questions. Uh, that's how we proceed. And there are exams are all open book, so they don't have to memorize every, anything. Much of the grade comes from the long research essay they will write on a particular topic. Uh, and, the, and that is when they will be encouraged to research new historicism, cultural materialism, deconstruction, et cetera, et cetera. And I also want to give you a caveat. Uh, when I when I arrived in America, um, it was the heyday of literary theory. Uh, but very quickly I realized I was not going to follow that path. Um, uh, primarily because I was in creative writing, we were in opposition to literary theory. Uh, although as a PhD student, I, I did engage uh, literary theory, but I have not been teaching it in any regular manner. So I uh, want to let you know about that particular aspect of our um, discipline. And uh, most of the uh, articles listed on the syllabus are no longer read in America. And Wilson Knight is gone. Uh, T.S. Eliot uh, is respected only as a poet and, uh, and mildly as a playwright. Um, Stephen Greenplatt, whom we will talk about a little bit, uh, has moved on from hardcore scholarship to being a public intellectual. He's, his books are all bestsellers. He's a big name. So, so we'll revisit that. 
um, is there some way some of you could talk to me um, i have a question what what is the malayalam word for renaissance punaruthan punaruthan okay uh, enlightenment what is the malayalam word for enlightenment okay navothanam okay okay very good very good <laughs> i i accepted it um so um i am also scheduled to talk about the enlightenment um so in some ways these two presentations will go together um and i do not see them as separate historical events um in america and and in the european tradition uh the term that is preferred uh is early modern studies or early modern literature which includes the renaissance the enlightenment and the enlightenment uh and it doesn't uh, make a rigid uh, uh boundaries between dates uh which were all sacrosanct when i was in college i was your age uh so uh navodhana uh enlightenment the word for enlightenment in kerala as i understand is gnanodayam gnanodayam uh did we have an enlightenment in india or in kerala if if renaissance is navodhanam did we have a moment when suddenly we decided we have to be a different kind of people any 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 response from the students no we any any movement in indian or kerala tradition where suddenly culture changed and uh, is vaikyam satyagraham one of those even yes yes sir all right all right um nara narayana guru would have been one of the individuals probably the most important individual in kerala who intellectually provided a a, a path for us to develop and become better human beings if you remember at the turn of the 20th century uh only very am um, very few people had access to temples um and there was strict caste uh demarcation caste based oppression um and social economic op oppression so so let's think about uh, the european renaissance in that spirit um by the way uh, yeah let me this is a slide i made for you english renaissance literature or early modern literature um if you are not familiar with the second term uh, please take a note of it uh, as you can see below all of those categories are in a way 
a march forward from the Greek tradition, which begins about 800 BC, to Roman tradition, which matures around 300 BC, and then it turns into an empire, and it lasts in the West until the year 474. Sorry, 476. Um, and Roman Empire collapses. It is replaced by uh, the church. Christianity evolves around this period. And when Roman Empire falls, Christianity stands and goes on to create a new European culture for the next thousand years. So from around the 476 onwards uh, to 1500 of uh, 1517 the year, um, we have the continuation of what we call the medieval period. Um, and and then transition into Renaissance, which uh, is a, a development that uh, transform into Reformation, the Enlightenment, uh, the Romantic criticism, um, uh, the Romantic critique of the Enlightenment, Modernism and Postmodernism. So all of these, um, if you if you look here. Um, this particular title um, in the year uh, 1486, uh, uh, a man named Giovanni Picodella Mirandola, uh, who was only 23 years old, uh, published 900 ideas on religion, philosophy, and science. Uh, and uh, challenged the Pope and the political establishment. Uh, and, and that these are the ideas that we need to go forward, um, go forward in order to ensure the dignity of man. So when I mentioned Narayana Guru, Vaikyam Satyagraham, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, all those ideas are ultimately about a so society's desire for greater dignity of man. Um, the, those guys did not even think about women at that time. And, and that had to develop in a later stage, uh, dignity of the human being. Uh, so, so the search for and the desire for and the pursuit of human dignity is at the heart of Renaissance. Um, by the way, before I go too far, I want to um, bring in this joke. Um, in America, pretty much in every town, we celebrate a, a Renaissance day sometime in summer. Uh, people dress up as um, ladies and gentlemen uh, from the age of the Renaissance. Um, and the uh, people dance, they sing uh, songs in the medieval, uh, in Middle English um, and French, etc. Um, um, the auditorium of our University is called a Renaissance Coliseum. Um, so I'm just mentioning it to uh, illustrate the extent of the influence this one uh, one word has, Renaissance, and uh, uh, Navodhanam, that idea of Navodhanam, and the feeling that uh, we need something new, we need to do things better. Uh, or, in other words, we need greater dignity. Uh, so if you look at uh, that passage, by the way, uh, the Pope got very angry 
at the Piccadilly Mirandola, and and he had to run away from from town. And by the age of thirty-one, he was dead, uh, poisoned by who, who knows what who. Uh, so so asking for dignity is not an easy thing. Uh, not to give dignity is uh, convenient to those who are in power. Um, in your discussions of Foucault, new historicism, cultural materialism, and all those terms, um, you would come across the term power. Uh, the, so, so we are, um, so Renaissance is uh, an early wrestling with the powers that be in changing the system. Um, and one of the arguments in English departments uh, that led to the creation of cultural studies, etc., was that instead of just studying Shakespeare uh, and praising him and thinking him of as a thinking about him as a great genius, etc., um, students of English literature or students of language uh, should consider themselves as students of culture. Um, and uh, their knowledge, their education should, should benefit society and improve culture and ensure greater and greater sense of dignity for the human being not even just for man, but dignity for man and woman, and also for the transgender and any, and also for animals. Uh, so uh, animals also deserve dignity. So this kind of larger engagement, engagement with, uh, with power is right there in the first few paragraphs of Piccadilla Merendola. So, uh, are you able to read it there? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, we have made you a creature, neither of heaven nor of earth, neither mortal nor immortal. Uh, so, who is we? Who made you a creature? Who made all human beings, right? Who is saying this? Um, keep thinking, keep thinking, I'll come to that. Uh, so we have made you a creature. Uh, we have made you an animal, basically. Uh, neither of heaven nor of earth, neither mortal nor immortal. So even in the, those two, first two clauses, you can see a revolution there. That revolution, instead of God saying, I made you a creature, it is gods saying, the gods of the ancient classical world, the Greece and Rome, they are saying, we have made you a creature in order that you may, as the free and proud shaper of your own being. Uh, so Renaissance, um, you may remember one of the essays you have to read is from Stephen Greenblatt's Renaissance Self-Fashioning. Um, see where that title may have come from. Proud shaper of your own being, fashion yourself in the form you may prefer. Um, uh, so how do you do that? It will be in your power to descend to the lower brutish forms of life, you will be able through your own decision to, add, to ascend again to superior orders whose life is divine. So um, remember, uh, you said uh, Renaissance is Navodhanam. A Navodhanam of what? Uh, Navodhanam, I'm going to skip a couple of slides. Um, so uh, if I, I, I trust that you are able to see this 
very dense list of navodhanam that took place can you are you able to read it yes sir yes 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 um it, i know it's a little too much uh, but i will keep coming back to it but i just want you to uh, pay attention here uh in the 12th century 13th century 14th century europe um you so you probably know that at that time europe did not develop into nation states as we understand them um the first to emerge as nation states were england france um and spain was actually in in the control of the muslims it was spain was a, a part of the umayyad the caliphate um so so what was christian uh was completely ruled by pope from rome uh through controlling local dukes and minor kings and um, and then at a later stage actually early early part of the this millennium or this past millennium holy roman empire emerged which was about 200 different nat rajakanmar uh, europe uh, gathering together and electing an emperor um so their goal was to create uh, their goal was for english people to become england for french people to become france to germans to become germans uh for italians to become italian but the pope would not allow it because pope could do anything he wanted so early on um slowly a political divide took place um uh, two political parties in all over europe one party would support the pope pope's ideas or pope's desires another party slowly developed uh, that supported the local kings so as you can see it is a struggle between church and state uh the state is not completely in place uh so the struggle is one of the political factors at the heart of the renaissance um so so if you are a local king you don't want the pope to tax you and and give you commands and uh, send a bishop to you to control you um so the the local king started to elect local bishops so that's where the struggle started so um so before you know it in a couple of centuries um there arose a new sense of or desire for secular power a secular power nation nation states um so this will develop by the ta- by the time the run- the reformation is over the popes bishops and clergy would be pushed back and a new tradition uh, emerges um and the old uh, pope control the scholastic philosophy pushed back a new philosophy emerges and out of that new philosophy emerges science mathematics uh, rational thinking um and the same kind of uh, phenomenon took place in social organization um by the way even at that time 1% of rich people controlled the 99% of the land and wealth uh so so dukes aristocrats feudal system 
um, they practically held everybody, every individual as a slave, even if not a name. Um, so this is this is the the socio-political trajectory. This is the kind of thinking that the new historicism is encouraging students of English literature to learn and to poke into. Um, and, and where did all of this come from? Um, again, the, the idea of Navothana. Um, as part of this pushback, uh, early Renaissance thinkers started to reject uh, scholastic philosophy, everything that was supported by Pope, etc. And they started looking for Plato, Aristotle, um, in, instead of Latin, everything was controlled in, you know, by Latin domination. Um, so an interest in Greek developed. Um, and, and this is how slowly culture changes. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, what you're seeing is uh, the Duomo or, or the Cathedral of Florence. Um, you know, the, the construction started early, um, uh, final years of the 13th century. Uh, but even after 100 years, they did not know how to build the dome. And uh, um, by the way, in this particular town in Italy, Florence, um, the, the rich people's money did not come from land. Um, so the richest family in town was the Medici's. Um, they were so powerful, they were bankers. Um, so they financed the building of this grand cathedral just to show off their wealth. But they could not, there was nobody in Europe who could build or complete the, the dome. Um, so uh, there were two Medici's that we should be talking about, uh, Cosimo Medici and Lorenzo the Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent. Um, at the time of Cosimo the Medici, a man named Filippo Brunelleschi said, I can build the dome. Um, how, did, how did he get the guts to say that? Um, he had gone to Rome and looked at the ruins of old Greek and Roman uh, Colosseum, pa pan uh, Pantheon. Um, so if you go to Rome, you'll see uh, 2,300 year, year old buildings with the dome standing just like that. But um, in the Middle Ages, much of most of them fell down uh, or or cannibalized, etc. So, so this man, uh, this banker, Medici family financed him. Be before you know it, he built. Uh, so in the year 1436, they finished the building this. So right, uh, right after that accomplishment, um, so if you, again, if you think about it, the idea for the architectural, the architectural secret for building the dome did not come from medieval Europe. It came from classical Europe of Greece and Rome. So Renaissance was a concerted effort, primarily funded by one person, uh, Lorenzo Medici, to, to collect any any old book, any Taliola Grantham, whatever it was available uh, in Greek, etc., in Arabic, and say they collected. Um, so by the end of uh, 14th century, um, uh, let me, okay. Um, are you able to see this, this slide, the beauty art? Yes, sir, yes. Yes, so um, 
So Renaissance, even though it became such a political, socio-economic event that would change not only Europe, but the whole world, but it started with the architecture. Somebody figuring out by poking in old documents and looking around in the ruins of Greece and Rome and figuring out the technique of building the dome. Um, just like that. Um, by the way, you would think uh, the works of Plato, Aristotle, uh, Lucretius, um, those kind of works of the ancient world were available. But the popes and the Christian church basically destroyed them all. They had totally disappeared. So because the Medici was paying good money for all the books, before you know it, uh, all the manuscripts started to come out. So by the end of that century, uh, okay, let me let me uh, slow down there one more time. So everything that I said just now, uh, classical art, uh, classical style of creating beauty, and classical ideas about what is valuable. Man is the measure of all things. That is Protagoras, who lived before uh, Socrates. Plato has written a book called Protagoras. Can you imagine in the Christian age, somebody saying man is the measure of all things, right? They would say God is the measure of all things. So, so, so classical ideas, the big classical ideas, man is the measure of all things. Um, slowly started to percolate um, and you may know that for the first 300 years Christianity did not even use art. Um, it, uh, remember the Ten Commandments, do not worship idols, uh, do not worship graven images. Uh, so only after the year 400, 430, that the Christianity starts to develop uh, um, images of Jesus, say, and then for the next 100 years, uh, Christ becomes a work of art. And the most important motif is that man is the measure of all things, Christ is the man, Christ who is suffering. Um, the first uh, truly great Pope, uh, his name is Pope Gregory the Great. Uh, so Gregory, Gregory the Great started to propagate this idea that you can, you don't have to think of the image of Jesus as a graven image. Do not think of it as an idol. Uh, do not think of it as a vigraham. Instead, worship it and use it to teach the Bible. Uh, so, very before, quickly image of Jesus as a boy, Jesus as a, a teenager, Jesus uh, teaching, Jesus dying, incarnation, resurrection, all of that um, started to appear in, uh, um, in art. So, uh, since we need to go a fa uh, little faster, I want you to remember this much. Renaissance, Navodhanam means Renaissance rejecting thousand plus years of Christian heritage and embracing the classical heritage. Um, and it is that simple. So, the Christians rejected the classical heritage as pagan. Um, soon after the Constantine conversion, there was an effort to destroy everything related to 
uh, the pagan gods, Apollo, Zeus, uh, Venus, etc. Um, so keep that idea in mind. So uh, in classical art, uh, you see human body, human body in its perfection. By the way, I have seen this. It's a uh, um, in a museum re near the Vatican. It's called uh, the the Dying Gaul or Dying Gaul Tribal. This is from the year uh, two uh, two hundred years before Christ. Um, look at the celebration of the naked male body. And also this is a celebration and the contemplation of the uh, death of human body. Uh, so it's a death uh, characterized. So the moment Renaissance understood that there needs to be a recovery of all the lost knowledge lost architecture, lost philosophy, lost literature, lost poetry, um, they started to create the art that is that was from that period. So if you look at that age, um, um, Tullio Lombardo, uh, this was the first artist to create a, a, a nude human figure styled exactly like in the classical age. Um, so the medieval age had a, a series of artistic styles, but it was never a celebration of the naked, naked human flesh and the glory of it. Remember, remember the, the motto, man is the measure of all things. By the way, this, uh, Sculpt, uh, sculpture is in New York, uh, considered a, a, a world treasure. So um, with that idea, um, I want to reinforce the same claim that classical world was pagan world. Pagan meant, pagan was something that Christianity rejected, that is, all the knowledge before Socrates, that is Thales, Eteximander, etc. They were basically first scientists. Um, you know, 2,600 years ago, people who wondered about astronomy, not astrology, but astronomy, people who tried to understand how the world is made of, whether the basic matter is water or air or earth, etc. Uh, so you may know all those names, Aristotle, Epicurus, Lucretius, Cicero, Seneca, Plotinus. And there is even a woman there, Lady Hypatia of Alexandria. Um, she lived uh, in the 5th century. So the final, she's probably one of the last pagans uh, to, to have had a, an influence on culture. Can you imagine what the Christians would have done to her? Uh, they caught her and they skinned her alive. Um, she was a great mathematician and a philosopher. So, so in that sense, um, this is not publicly announced in this manner. Uh, Christianity rises, Rome falls, and then Europe is repopulated. New languages um, are born, English, French, German, Italian, they, those languages did not exist when uh, in the early years of Christianity. And then uh, classical knowledge disappears, then a thousand year long Middle Ages. Um, and, um, and in the southern part of Europe, uh, Islamic power also arrives. Um, so I want to point out just one more detail uh, this particular writer, Lucretius, he wrote a book called uh, The Order of the Universe. If you read it, it looks like Darwin wrote it. Charles Darwin wrote it. Um, so, uh, discovery of that book. Uh, this is a copy of it. 
it's called the swerve um, swerve uh it is stephen greenblatt's book um this whole book is about how a man named Pocio Brocellini uh, found a copy of um, a book by Lucretius, which contained the uh, basics of all the knowledge about the nature, physics, uh, biology, etc. at that time. So what was his uh, basic idea? Uh, it was not his own idea. It was the idea of that tradition that the world is not made of water or earth or air, world made of atoms um, and, and the smallest particle, uh, the uncuttable. Um, the, so the idea of atoms already exists. This is before Christ. Uh, Remember the age, the year 420 BC, etc. Um, by the way, Indians also had the same idea, Paramanu, uh, ancient Greece tradition. Um, Aristotle uh, toyed with it. And then uh, uh, in the 20th century, once uh, we developed uh, a decent uh, knowledge of physics, we adopted that term atoms, um, electrons, neutrons, etc., uh, the subcategories. Um, so I, th I think I've made my point about how Renaissance was primarily a desire for greater human dignity. And then uh, many intellectuals recognized that that dignity was already available uh, before Christ um, in the pagan world. Um, so in books like Lucretius, De Rerum Natura, um, it was discovered in the year 1417. So you could say Renaissance starts on the year 1417. Um, but there are so many other dates. Um, you could say Renaissance starts with the uh, Vatican librarian Lawrence of Valla, um, who is probably the first textual critic. Um, he was a, a reverend father, a secretary to the Pope. Um, he analyzed the documents. There was a document called uh, Donation of Constantine. Um, and the claim was Const Roman Emperor Constantine gave all of Europe as a donation to the church. And the, it was church's property. Nobody has a question, uh, right to question it. So uh, this priest uh, read the language analyzed the linguistics of it, um, the rhetoric of it, and he decided it was not written in the year four, in fourth century, it was written in the eighth century. Um, and that was actually one of the first breakthroughs. So uh, a discovery of the uh, rerum natura, the idea of the world made up of atoms, and discovery of Aristotle's poetics. You would all think uh, everybody had a copy of Aristotle's poetics. Uh, actually, the Arabs had a copy or many copies, and one of those copies landed around that, uh, that time. Um, so I'm going to run a, a little farther a cosmology out of the big topic. We may come back to it. I want to introduce you to the next the major face of the Renaissance. Uh, this is Francesco Petrarch. Um, Petrarch, uh, you could say Renaissance starts with the Petrarch. Uh, so how could that be? Um, look at the date. Father of humanism, 
ഫാദർ ഓഫ് റെണസാൻസ് പ്രോജറിറ്റർ ഓഫ് ദ സോണറ്റ് ഫസ്റ്റ് ടൂറിസ്റ്റ് ഫസ്റ്റ് ടു ഹാവ് ക്ലൈംഡ് ടു ഹാവ് ക്ലൈംഡ് സോറി സ്കെയിൽഡ് മൗണ്ട് വൺ ടു ദ ഫസ്റ്റ് ടു സേ ഡാർക്ക് ഏജസ് ഫസ്റ്റ് ടു റെക്കവർ ദ ക്ലാസിക്കൽ വർക്ക്സ് ഓഫ് ഗ്രീസ് ആൻഡ് റോം so you can say in one person everything that we have been talking about and everything we are going to talk um, especially in the context of shakespeare uh, marlo etc so father of humanism remember that phrase man is the measure of all things uh, and uh, um, he went on a mountain he climbed a mountain uh, you and i have all climbed kurishmala right um you have a lot of people would climb the kurishmala with a kurisha and, and and do it as a spiritual work but uh, petrarch climbed just for the sake of it uh, so it is said that the moment uh, petrarch climbed the mountain and came down from it that moment renaissance started a uh, rediscovery of the inner world not the ascent of went to but it is with the descent uh, that the renaissance begins okay so so how does all this material how do uh, you know fit into our discussion um what happened was in the year 1327 april 6 it was an easter day um petrarch so this woman at the church um and he started to worship her um if you are a christian in the middle ages you don't worship a woman you worship only virgin mary um so petrarch he saw her only a, a couple of times and the the following year um actually exactly on the same date she died so a man a human being named petrarch who has been reading all the classical poets and philosophers who had been thinking that um, everything that uh, the that europe accomplished in the last 1000 years was kind of primitive um suddenly found uh, a secular virgin mary in a married woman named laura uh, and who died also so so he started writing poems um he wrote 366 poems all addressed to laura all describing his suffering in the name of laura um this is petrarch's uh, sonnet number 132 uh, by the way i have to add one more detail um you will be studying the literature of the me- medieval english literature in another class and and if you look at all the writings before the renaissance you will see long poems a lot of them boring stuff about uh, heroes and and kings and um and spirits etc um you will rarely see poem about private love poem about what we call in kerala college campuses premam um so this is the first uh, pure human devotion to beauty uh created by a poet who just radically breaks with the past um and and in a human being by the way this is exactly the reason mona lisa is adored you see in a human body 
a human pers uh, perfection that is not religious, that is secular. Um, and uh, and look at look at the, the if it is not love, then what is it I feel? But if it is love by God, what is this thing? If God, why then the uh, the bar of mortal sting? Uh, so um, so this poem, um, three hundred and sixty six of them, all short. And they are not long narrative poems. They are not epics. They are not about schlock. They are called the lyric, lyric poetry. Um, if you remember the list of things that changed, great Renaissance transitions from medieval Christian art back to classical art and architecture, um, from epic heroic, mythical, theological poems to lyric, lyric poetry, a tiny little private song, tiny little secular prayer, um, tiny little prayer malekhan of each of them, uh, and also drama, uh, the Greek drama, you know, Aeschylus, Euripides, uh, uh, etc., Sophocles, right? And uh, you also know Latin drama, Plautus, Seneca, uh, etc. So, uh, so the great dramatic tradition of Greece and Rome also died out in the Middle Ages. Uh, so Renaissance brought back lyric poetry and, and drama. Drama that was dead suddenly comes alive and then Eventually, after, um, later in the 18th century, we have the novel. Uh, so, I am pretty sure you have a sense of how broad-based this simple desire for change and human dignity and acknowledgement of what is in the heart um, uh, one of the great ideas of this particular age is Plato's Symposium um, and uh, a new philosophy that develops called uh, Neoplatonism. Um, and the idea is that you have an obligation to climb the ladder. Remember uh, the oration on the dignity of man. You have the uh, option of becoming an animal and descending or becoming a great human being and ascending the ladder. Um, so uh, so the, the image of ladder of love became crucial in an, uh, all the language and artistic traditions of Europe. Um, and pretty much everywhere, uh, intellectuals, forward-looking individuals started to write poems uh, imitating Petrarch, um, imitating often an imaginary Laura. Um, so uh, if, if you remember this particular detail, in England alone, uh, we have around a lot of sonnets have survived from this period. So, so it was a uh, massive cultural transformation. Um, and the very first uh, individual in England to uh, remember, England is part of Northern Europe. All these changes took place in Southern Europe, primarily in Italy, because the Medici family was unique and they had so much money and they wanted to show off. So they uh, collected good books and they gathered uh, intellectuals uh, and artists like uh, Ghiberti, Brunelleschi, Michelangelo, Titian, Titian, Vasari, all the Raphael, Botticelli, uh, uh, Da Vinci, all these people gathered there and they found uh, an audience in Italy. But in England, as early as uh, late 14th century, Geoffrey Chaucer translated Petrarch. 
132, sonnet 132. Um, uh, it's beautiful, beautiful translation, but it is not English that we understand. This is Middle English. Um, Middle English will change into modern English in the year, roughly in the year 1485 onwards, maybe 1500 onwards. Um, and, and you may have studied in linguistics class that uh, something called a great uh, vowel shift, uh, shift took place and the English pronunciation changed and grammar changed. Uh, so, um, so by the final years of 14th century, um, even Chaucer translated it, but it didn't click. Um, in Malayalam, I myself translated the same uh, sonnet, uh, just for your enjoyment. Um, it goes like this. This is the poem, Petrarch, sonnet 132. If it is not love, then what is it I feel? I translated it like this. Premam en on ille, penne endaan enikkittara unmadam. Ado, adu kamadevan anu, avan evide. Premam nan me anangil, pin enda and any ketra vedana. Then me anangil, premathin enda and itra ruji. So manasa nirun nanyan, endu parifum parayan. A check of every the mingle, endin and yan viagula patanum. Oh, endura jeevan maranum, endu sukamulla dukum, the premum. Kamadeva, nerekan American karilla, warangi and yan kurangi. Either Katakal Ladich Mungan, a couple Lilian Kudungi, Arvilai Mamatran Jamakunanan, Venal Vergolunu, Saitil Katijuelikun. So, Renaissance Malayalatil on the pole, Anganet. For uh, um, Petrarch was widely followed everywhere, as I mentioned, and England modern english literature is basically a for uh, an engagement with petrarch engagement with petrarch's poetry so uh, sir thomas wyatt uh, henry howard Earl of surrey sir edmund spencer uh, philip sidney and of course uh, william shakespeare um sequence uh, Concernier about the secular holy Laura. Um, that was also the very first, one of the first printed books. By the way, uh, books started printed. Uh, printed books started to come out in the year 1455 uh, onwards. By the year five, 1500, um, all over Europe, there were a thousand printers. Um, so, so the world suddenly changed uh, for culture. Um, and uh, every copy of Plato, Aristotle, Lucretius that uh, the Medici family had, they had it translated into Italian and into Latin, etc. And uh, so those books became available. Um, so, so no wonder in England, uh, Sir Philip Sidney, wrote a uh, um, sonnet sequence, Astrophil and Stella, uh, Wyatt and Surrey. Uh, these, these two guys were the most important uh, literary figures of modern English literature, the first. Um, and they started off by translating Petrarch. Um, 100 years prior to that, uh, Chaucer had tried to do it, but it didn't click. England was still in the Middle Ages. But uh, when these two guys, um, they traveled to Europe, um, they both of them worked as um, diplomats for Henry VIII, Henry VII and Henry VIII. Um, and, and both of them were greatly endangered because of the nearness to this very tempestuous political rule. Um, actually, Saray was beheaded for uh, 
um, accused of uh, treason and Wyatt himself was in jail. Wyatt was also a relative of Anne, Anne Boleyn. Uh, so, so these guys um, suddenly in a new kind of cutthroat political uh, environment. Remember, um, until the Tudors come to power in England, England was not really a country. It was a bunch of dukedoms uh, clubbed together uh, by the Plantagenets. And they were all um, in the about half of 14th century and 15th century, they were um, waging endless wars between each other. Um, so, so the power was power in England was uh, decentralized. But by the time of the Tudors, if you are anybody, if you want anything, you had to come to London and you had to try to get a job at the palace. Uh, and you had to be willing to do anything. You had to, you had to kill just to get ahead. So, so that's why all these guys are suddenly in London um, population grows in London, and that's how P uh, theater uh, um, emerges or re-emerges. And uh, one of those figures was Thomas More. Um, Thomas More, um, I, I see that he had to study utopia, um, Thomas More's utopia. Let me let me ask. Uh, let me just touch base with the class. How? Do you, do you want me to continue in this way? Um, is this helpful for you? Yes, sir, yes, really. yes, it's helpful. Okay, um, and, and the rest of the talk, I'm planning to kind of um, uh, touch on various works you would be reading. I know that you are reading uh, Utopia. Um, uh, I realized that you, you did not, uh, the syllabus doesn't include uh, Wyatt and Surrey, uh, which is a terrible mistake. Without Wyatt and Surrey, there is no Renaissance English literature. Um, Surrey is the person who created um, blank verse. Blank verse is the workhorse of theater. So Shakespeare is and all Shakespeare works are is in 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 blank words and it's in poetry. Um, and uh, and and both Wyatt and Surrey in themselves uh, contain another major Renaissance philosophical idea which is pastoralism. Uh, pastoralism, especially uh, some of the poems by uh, Surrey are pastoral. Um, several major works by Spencer are pastoral. Um, about half of Shakespeare plays <coughs> have pastoral elements. Uh, uh, Shakespeare's great work, uh, Venus and Adonis, uh, 2000 lines, is entirely pastoral. Um, entirely Renaissance uh, response to the Renaissance and the idea. Uh, remember, I told you, the young educated men were uh, crowding streets of London, willing to do anything they want. And you could be killed, you could lose your head. Um, and, you, and you were uh, uh, asked to go and kill others, um, etc. for in the interest of this new thing called a nation state, England as a nation. Uh, France also becomes a nation, uh, pretty much uh, in intact. Uh, but Italy, in Italy, that doesn't happen, and uh, um, in in Germany, that doesn't happen. Uh, so, so a lot of problems are there, and um, I will vis revisit some of those as we. Um, we consider some of the literary works, uh, Utopia. Um, remember, 
the works of Greece and Rome are, are being revived. So can, you, can anybody tell me what the utopia is? What is, what Greek work is underlying utopia? One particular Greek work, um, Plato's Republic. Um, Plato imagined how, how to rule society, how to organize uh, society for happiness and pursuit of happiness, for equality, justice, for the dignity of the human being. Uh, so Plato had an elaborate <coughs> framework, uh, forgive me, framework for that. And uh, right at the start of the medieval age, when suddenly Christian institutions found themselves in charge of the Roman Empire, they also started thinking about how to organize society. Uh, um, that was the City of God by Saint Augustine. Um, Saint Augustine wrote five million words uh, on that question, how to run a society. Um, so um, in Renaissance, Thomas More wrote Utopia as, you, as the Republic. Um, so he's, um, Saint, Saint Augustine created the city of God as a Republic, um, a spiritual city. Uh, God, the king, kingdom of heaven, basic kingdom of uh, heaven. Uh, but uh, for Thomas More, Utopia is pastoral. Uh, utopia is a, a running away from, from the city. Uh, utopia is actually a return to paradise. Um, so uh, you will see that theme in uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, Greenblatt has written a new book about the, the importance of that one idea that human beings were evicted from paradise for uh, one particular sin. Um, and what is the sin? Um, the desire to eat the apple, apple of knowledge, eat from the tree of knowledge. Um, so as a consequence, uh, you lose your condition of innocence. You lose your paradise. You become aware of your mortality. You become aware of your shame. You um, you have to work to make a living. Um, so uh, society, and you have um, greed, desire, um, terrible, terrible, sinful nature. Uh, so all of that, um, Thomas More imagined a situation where that could be reversed um, and uh, creates a, a, a culture where there is no uh, money, for instance. Gold is not, um, gold is used to, you know, build bricks and uh, um, pave, the, pave the roads and, and they just throw gold away, etc. stuff like that. Um, and uh, uh, people work only a very limited hour, number of hours and people live uh, like in Kurishamala. Uh, in fact, Thomas More's Utopia is actually a mon monastery. Um, it is like an ashram, uh, a retreat. Um, so, um, you know what happened to Thomas More, right? Thomas More got caught in the Renaissance uh, Reformation struggle and for uh, sticking to, uh, staying with the Catholic Church, uh, Henry VIII, um, executed him, beheaded him. So, uh, Saray was beheaded, Thomas More was beheaded. Um, and now Thomas More is a saint of the Catholic Church. You could pray to him, Saint Thomas More. Um, but primarily his importance is that he created a 
beautiful literary work uh, that, at least in England, uh, shows the human desire to improve society, improve culture. Uh, so, so he would have been. So Sir Thomas More would be a monk in in that spirit. He actually wore a hair shirt and underneath. Um, and uh, so so he lived as a secret Franciscan in a, in a way. Um, but the gist of it is that uh, this kind of platonic, idealistic, perfect society uh, requires that you reject uh, the materialistic world. You reorganize your society. So in that sense, it's a communism. Uh, you, you're creating a commune. So Karl Marx and any any revolutionary thinker anywhere uh, would find their or trace the their origins to utopia. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, this is a scheme I created um, just to show you what an important cultural and the literary idea utopia is. Um, utopia is basically going back to paradise, or trying to be like Adam and Eve. Um, and uh, so, and, and the same idea you see in Greek mythology, golden age, um, a biblical paradise, uh, Semitic peoples are Delman, Plato's a Republic, uh, Zeno, uh, the founder of uh, Stoic philosophy, City of God, Saint Augustine, Arcadia uh, by um, um, Sydney, uh, Cocagne. It's a um, it's it's a it's a Welsh uh, idea. Shangri-La, um, uh, Nepal, the Himalayan people, New Atlantis, uh, Francis Bacon, Erwin, Butler, Blazing World. Uh, uh, I forgot her name, Lady. Uh, I'll 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 come to her. Um, very important woman writer. Uh, and Kingdom of Heaven, classless society, communism, communes, Walden, Walden two. Um, so there is no end to this particular thread in in the Renaissance literature, and you see that primarily in. Um, in Shakespeare. Um, since we don't have a, since you're not studying uh, Wyatt, I don't want to spend any time on it. Um, uh, you can just see how important both of these guys were because every Petra poem these writers translated into English and then when they ran out of poems to translate, they started their own poems. Um, so the literary form of sonnet, instead of a large uh, 300, 600, uh, fairy squid is 600 plus pages long um, work, you have a private lyrical poem, just 14 lines, um, braided like, um, you know, a, a, a pretzel, very or a, or a jewel, elaborate. So, um, so writing a good sonnet is like uh, learning to play tennis. Um, you can run around with a racket uh, anywhere, but you uh, playing with an opponent, with a net, and with the uh, the court marked with boundaries and being able to hit. Uh, in the proper way, that is not a small thing. So for Renaissance um, individuals, um, this was a kind of personal perfection. Um, you know, Machiavelli's The Prince, right? Another early political treatise of the Renaissance that uh, taught 
a ruler, how to prepare himself to be a ruler. Um, his key idea is that a ruler uh, must be able to uh, to be feared. You should make your uh, uh, subjects fear you instead of love you. Um, love is easy, fear is better. Um, don't pay any attention to religion, but you just pretend that you are very religious. Um, you have only one obligation to run your nation, to, uh, to care for the welfare, the real welfare of your individual. Even when you are uh, at a party or a picnic, a prince will have to be looking around and see where the army can be placed, etc. So elaborate. And uh, a prince will have to be a fox and a lion at the same time, etc. Um, so this kind of um, self-fashioning ideas and books started to come out. Um, uh, Machiavelli arrived in England very clearly the prince, uh, but even more importantly, the other book uh, called The Courtier by Baldassare Castiglioni. Um, it, it told, uh, it instructed uh, ordinary individuals, uh, educated individuals about how to prepare themselves to, to be a good courtier, which means uh, be a in, uh, good intellectual uh, leader um, how you can help the prince, etc. Um, Thomas Hobby translated uh, Castiglione's Courtier into English. So that is one of the major books uh, that would uh, influence all these writers we have been uh, talking about. Uh, so Seneca is the other, uh, probably the most important single name to remember. In, uh, in terms of the Renaissance is Seneca, um, who was born in the year 4 BC. Um, that was the year Jesus was born, 4 BC. And, and he died in the year 65. Actually, em he was Emperor Nero's prime minister and teacher. He was Emperor Nero's professor. Um, Nero got upset with him one day and Nero ordered Seneca to commit suicide. Uh, Seneca went into a bathtub, filled the bathtub and cut his uh, veins open and bled to death. Um, so that is Seneca. Seneca was arguably the most important playwright and philosopher of the first century. Uh, so he's a contemporary of Jesus. He worked for several Roman emperors. He died in a terrible way, terrible way. But all his works survived. All his letters uh, you can buy. Um, and so preeminent Roman author to reappear in Renaissance. Uh, when Shakespeare was a, a young man arriving in London, um, he must have bought a copy of 10 plays by Seneca. Uh, so Seneca has uh, this ultimate pagan philosopher writer, uh, was revered by Christians. Uh, and there is even a, a forged letter, uh, uh, St. Paul wrote St. Paul's letter to Seneca. Uh, it is um, so a way for Christians to try to embrace uh, this first century intellectual. So, um, Shakespeare figured out everything he wanted to figure out. If, he, if Shakespeare read any book, this is very likely one of the books. Uh, um, ten, 10 tragedies of Seneca. Um, and, and also uh, Seneca's philosophy, we'll, we'll talk about it. And Seneca's prose style, Seneca's language, prose, is just fantastic. Um, you see Seneca in Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon's style is primarily Seneca's 
amble. Um, so let us move forward under Shakespeare. So you know who Shakespeare is now, right? Shakespeare, growing up, he would have read English translations of a lot of the writers we have been talking about. And definitely knew Seneca tragedy. Um, uh, Shakespeare mentions Seneca twice in uh, Hamlet. The name is mentioned um, and, and, Im and also implied in a, in, a, in, a, in a serious way. So what is Seneca tragedy? Um, me, okay, uh, I, I mentioned some of these. Um, a secret murder, a ghost appears to a son of the murdered man, the hero and the villain in slight pursuit of each other. Um, so, uh, by the way, you may know that theater did not exist uh, 50 years prior to Shakespeare. So theater is a new phenomenon and it is new and it became possible just because there were people living in the city and they wanted entertainment. And a lot of people were imitating things from classical age. So, so revenge tragedy becomes a possibility. Um, since we are a little behind the schedule, let me just um, touch on Shake, um, Hamlet a little bit. Um, so Hamlet uh, is a revenge tragedy. Re Hamlet is a Seneca play in that sense. Uh, so what do we know about Hamlet that uh, identifies Hamlet as a Renaissance figure? Um, I want to read a little passage for you. This is Ophelia, after Hamlet has a fit, uh, Hamlet uh, goes crazy, curses Ophelia, uh, go to a nunnery, etc. that speech, and, and, and trots away as a total lunatic. Ophelia says about Hamlet this, oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. Uh, the courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword. Um, everything that I've been talking about, the Renaissance is right there, right? How to be a courtier, how to be a soldier, how to be a scholar, uh, how to be able to see, speak, uh, fight. Um, how the expect, expectancy and roles of the fair state, how to be a, a, a prince or a, a ruler or a, um, a diplomat, the glass of fashion and the mold of form. As, uh, remember the self-fashioning idea, um, the ultimate individual, um, uh, an individual worthy of being imitated, of the observed or all observers, quiet, quiet down. So look at this man who is the observed of all observers. Uh, and I, of ladies most dejected, wretched, uh, the suck the honey of his music vows, etc., etc. How horrible it is. So here you have a picture of what a Renaissance man is um, and how Ophelia understands her love for um, Hamlet as not just the love of anybody, but uh, a, a courtier, a man who climbed the ladder of love. That's how she must have understood it. Um, so, 
So, do you remember where Hamlet came from to attend the funeral of his father or to mourn for his father? Do you remember the name of the city? Wittenberg. Very good. <laughs> what is the connection to Renaissance and Wittenberg? Dr. Faustus was there. Correct. So two of the plays are connected to the University of Wittenberg, exactly where Martin Luther in the year 1517, that is 503, four years, 504 years ago. Uh, Martin Luther posted 95 theses. Um, we talked about uh, Piccadilla Mirandola's 900 theses. Uh, so, so here is very definite connection to Renaissance. Um, so how old is Hamlet? Do you remember? Later in the play, we figure out that Hamlet is 30 years old. Um, if you're a 30 year old man, if you're still hanging around in college, and if you're still acting in plays and not coming home um, and to rule and take over power, if in his absence, uncle takes the power and kills dad, etc. So, So you have a picture of uh, Hamlet's priorities. Hamlet, Hamlet is a Renaissance man, um, and and uh, in other words, Hamlet is a thinking man. Uh, if you are a thinking man, will you commit revenge? Will you murder a person? That is uh, the problem. So I would say uh, T.S. Eliot is wrong in his long essay about uh, Hamlet and his problems. I would say everybody else um, who have written about uh, Hamlet's metaphysical issues is basically the ultimate human question that you see right away at the start of the Bible um, and so many other works. Um, do you have the right how do you why do you kill your brother have you killed your what have you done to your brother that question what have you done to your brother the story of abel and cain um and beowulf you you will be studying beowulf in another class i know um in beowulf the obligation of a son is to kill um, anybody who wronged him or his family. Um, and there is a king who has two sons and one of the sons killed the other son. So, so father's obligation would be to kill, you know, seek revenge for uh, uh, the death of that son. And, and uh, that happens to be the other son. So, so this is, this is what uh, Hamlet is facing. Hamlet comes home um, and uh, um, suddenly mom is in bed with uncle and things are not what it looks like. Um, and uh, of course a, a ghost appears and uh, uh, tells you what exactly happened. But if you are a Renaissance man, if you are a philosopher, if you have studied uh, Aristotle, you basically don't believe in ghosts. Um, <clears throat> and if you are a um, Protestant, you don't believe in purgatory. That is one of the things uh, the ghost says, I came out of purgatory. Uh, so, so I want to argue that Hamlet is 
is easy to understand not uh, we don't even need of course we can use uh, uh, ernest john's idea of um, oedipus oedipal complex oedipus complex that uh, um, uh, as you know from the john's essay oedipus complex is a, a, a theory in child development a normal child will grow up, uh, learn from mother and father, uh, but uh, once he is an adult, uh, he will find a young woman and uh, uh, transfer the love and marriage and embrace. Um, basically, you will be forgetting your father and forgetting your mother. So what is, what does the ghost the gist of what the ghost tells uh hamlet uh many times uh, the ghost tells remember me remember me so uh, an intellectual like uh, <coughs> hamlet's uh, obligation uh, if you are to follow the child development theory um his whatever has happened his obligation would be to forget the father and embrace ophelia what does he do he rejects ophelia he has a temper tantrum he is totally lost why is he lost uh because he is not able to reconcile with all that has happened to him, the ghost itself. Um, and the claim that uh, the ghost claimed that uh, the father, uh, uh, the uncle murdered him in this way. Um, so if you're a modern person, if, if a ghost appears to you and, and tells you to go and kill somebody, will you kill? Uh, of course, in Andhra Pradesh, something like that happened recently. But um, but we modern people, we do not listen. Uh, so so Hamlet's problem is being a thinking man, um, and and so he wants to verify this this claim by the ghost. Um, whether it is a part of his conscience. So in order to verify, verify is also a scientific term, right? Um, so through art, through setting up a play, um, he wants to verify. Uh, so wants to give uh, Claudius a psychology test, you know, right? Um, and, and to figure out whether he could be guilty. And uh, Hamlet doesn't want to be the judge. Even then, he wants Horatio to judge, to to be the uh, impassioned judge. Um, there is a long passage in which uh, um, Hamlet tells Horatio that you are a perfect human being. You are a stoic. Uh, you are a balanced person. You are educated. You are a Renaissance man, etc. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense. Uh, uh, you could say that uh, Freud is correct that Shakespeare, uh, Hamlet, uh, has been an, unable to mature as an adult, and uh, and and that problem has been going on. He's already thirty, which is indicative of uh, of that particular problem. Uh, uh, but as uh, uh, Greenblatt says, the, it is such a complex. Uh, absolutely uh, the greatest work of literature in English. Um, and I think Keats may have figured it out better than anybody else, uh, the value of Shakespeare, which is that unlike anybody else that uh, Keats is aware of, Shakespeare has negative capability and an ability to to function, an ability to have his characters function in uncertainties, 
an ability to empty the author, the author's ego, ability to distance uh, oneself from the character and uh, uh, dive completely into the character without the ego, etc. Negative capability. So, so if there is one term that accounts for the uniqueness of Shakespeare is that he was, um, in addition to uh, this particular aesthetic bend, um, he worked on adapted stories, uh, engaged massive historical phenomenon. By the way, I wanted to talk about Henry the Fourth. Uh, Marlowe, etc. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, but about Hamlet, I want to say it is easier to understand Hamlet's crisis if you understand Renaissance. And, and, and that is how new historicists, thinkers, and feminists and uh, um, psychological critics have analyzed Hamlet and Shakespeare's work in general. A word about Christopher Marlowe. Um, have you finished studying Dr. Faustus? No, sir, no. OK. Um, this is another fantastic example of a Renaissance, Dr. Faustus. Um, the idea of or the the idea of selling your soul to the devil. Uh, what did uh, Dr. Faustus gain by selling the soul? Why did he decide to sell the soul? Um, let us look at what all he rejected. A rejected logic, medicine, law, Bible, um, all the Christian virtues, faith, hope, charity. And he wanted uh, something different, a greater power. Um, and you and I know the word for it, forbidden knowledge. What, uh, what did uh, Adam and Eve help themselves to forbidden knowledge. What was the forbidden knowledge uh, Prometheus got? Right? Um, so, <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you a clue about um, some of the first moves Dr. Faustus makes up after he sells his soul. Um, <coughs> The first uh, thing he wants to um, get is get married, right? Um, and, and of course, that's a joke. Um, after that, he wants a book on astronomy. Can you imagine after selling the soul, Dr. Faustus wants to go to college, basically, uh, and read the book on astronomy. And, and all the books that follow that he asked for, uh, geography, uh, bio, um, you know, what we would call botany, et cetera. Uh, so, so knowledge, he's selling, so Dr. Faustus is not selling his soul to, um, so he could become a magician, get a magic, he could have ultimate knowledge. Knowledge about what? What is the ultimate knowledge? Um, knowledge about uh, what the hell is happening to us? Where are we? Why is something there instead of nothing? What is the meaning of life, etc. cetera? Um, and uh, so early clues about this is available if you look closely at the good angel and the bad angel. Um, the good angel gives terrible advice, kind of boring advice, be nice, 
pray to God, don't do this. But what does the bad angel say? Go forward. Go forward. Um, be forward looking. Um, so, so anybody who is analyzing using new historical analyze analytical tools or using any kind of textual analysis that we saw uh, crack the code or uh, um, the donation of Constantine, you know, all those years ago, you can tell that Faustus um, rejected some knowledge. Um, he wanted a even better knowledge. He wanted forbidden knowledge. Um, I would even say he wants knowledge of technology. Um, and uh, in the, uh, of course, for, uh, Faustus is presented as a kind of foolish comical figure uh, by Marla, who was uh, a true philosopher, very highly educated, thoughtful, uh, pure uh, Renaissance figure who understood it all. And uh, um, in some ways, even more forward looking, more aware of the desire for human dignity than even Shakespeare. Um, so all I'm saying is, a lot of the general public discussion on Faustus is wrong. Faustus is not a comic villain. Faustus is a Promethean figure. Uh, he, Prometheus stole fire and gave it to human beings. Prometheus the Titan. Um, can you imagine human beings living without fire? Um, what do you want in your life? Do you rather have electricity or prayer, right? Or, or a whole bunch of religious ideas. Um, so, so this is where the core Renaissance and Enlightenment ideas are. Um, it is basically on the side of the bad angel. So if you check out, when you read the play, read carefully what the bad angel says. And you will realize um, you and I, in the 21st century, we side with the bad angel. Um, so uh, that was a challenging idea, right? Um, so the entire new historicist establishment um, and deconstruction, they all open up this kind of questioning. Um, since we haven't uh, uh, talked about Henry the Fourth part one, um, I know you'll be reading it. Um, that is that is one of the best historical plays ever. Um, anybody's. And that is the play in which you have Falstaff. Um, Falstaff is actually Shakespeare. Uh, Falstaff is also uh, Socrates. Um, in fact, um, uh, Prince Hal uh, basically calls him a misleader of youth, uh, Falstaff. Um, the great comic figure. Uh, so what, what is the importance of Henry IV, part one? It tells you the story of how, remember, remember my long discussion about how in Europe, uh, local political powers, not Rajak and Mar, they wanted to be free of religion or religious control or Pope's control, and they wanted to create a secular government. 
സെക്കുലർ നാഷണലിസം ഇംഗ്ലണ്ട് ഫ്രാൻസ് ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റലി ഓൺലി കംസ് ഇൻ ദ ബേയിങ് ഓൺലി ഇൻ ദ നയൻറ്റീൻ സെഞ്ചുറി ജർമ്മനി ഓൾസോ ഡിഡ് നോട്ട് കം ടുഗെദർ എക്സെട്ര സോ ദാറ്റ് ഫെനാമിനൻ യു സി ഇൻ ഹെൻഡ്രി ദ ഫോർ ഇൻ ദ ഫൈനൽ ഇയേഴ്സ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ആക്ച്വലി ദ മിഡിൽ ഓഫ് ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ഇയേഴ്സ് വോർ and you may remember that uh, um england um the the plantagenets who ruled england at the time um middle ages beginning in the year six, uh, 1066 onwards um and beginning with henry the second sorry henry the second uh, who married uh, a french queen england pretty much owned about half of france also uh and dukedoms so so the english started to say france is mine and the french local king started to push back and uh, they went the war that lasted 100 years um you know john of arc um that uh, the john of arc even happened in the final years of that uh so all of that comes to an end in the year 1485 um and the tudor dynasty begins and you could say at that time the middle ages end and modern age begins english uh, renaissance age begins um very quickly in the year 1517 martin luther 1536 um henry breaks with the church and declares um himself the pope of english church um and before you know it um protestant uh, revolution has taken place europe has split into two church split into two and and they would fight for 30 years the catholic supportive kings of northern europe and uh, um uh the protestant support of kings um and and that particular event comes to a close in the year 1649 um so so renaissance in a way uh matures into a split in the church um and one way of thinking about uh reformation and protestant revolution was basically a rejection of religion itself um of course they have turned in the churches they create new churches but basic issue there was uh luther and calvin saying that we don't need religion we have the bible we know how to read it we know how to interpret it and they start educating everybody by the end of the renaissance period 60% of english people could read um and and the rest is history um england that did not exist uh when julius caesar arrived in the year 40 uh, in uh, 53 bc uh slowly developed and developed the watershed event was um splitting from europe splitting from papal power and enabling itself uh to develop uh according to individual conscience um and you know in the year 1611 um english bible was published king james bible until then it was illegal for anybody to translate the bible or even own a bible um john wickliff who translated the bible he was a contemporary of chaucer uh, he his body was dug up and hung when it was learned that he had tried to translate the bible william tendale who translated much of uh, the um king james bible uh, was arrested and strangled to death uh, so all of these events 
um, were part of this grand struggle for the dignity, for human dignity. Um, and human dignity were, that was denied and monopolized by various kinds of feudal and religious powers and, and science and, and all kinds of accomplishments of, the, um, of antiquity uh, disappeared and then that reappeared and creates a new culture. Um, in the process, middle class, a middle class comes into existence um, and people start to travel, uh, colonization begins, business begins, everything that uh, utopia would have cautioned against. Um, so, so the opposite of all this phenomenon is pastoralism and which is uh, a very important thread. Um, I just realized that I have only reached halfway into the talk and we don't have any more time left. Do you have any questions? <laughs> I can stay longer if you want. So we have a question. Yes. Sir, I want to ask you one question. The question is, do you mean to say that Oedipus complex is only a phase in the development of exile psychology? Yes. One if you are a normal, if you are a normal child, you would have overcome it, and and then you would have embraced Ophelia, and there would not have been a problem. Um, see against whom Hamlet turns. Hamlet is brutal toward Ophelia. She did nothing wrong, except that her father said, return all the love letters, pretend that you don't like her, like him, right? And, and uh, the first two acts of um, Hamlet reveals that this place is rotten. Father is giving terrible kind of advice to children. Father is sending a spy to check on the son. And father and the king are spying on the daughter, returning the love letters to, the, to Hamlet. So uh, uh, the latest philosophical insight about uh, why Hamlet ends up this way is that the, the moment he returns, the moment he sees what has happened to Ophelia, what has happened to his mother, he realized something in himself that there is no love. I cannot love. And, and that, that horror uh, of a thinking man. So the, the philosophical idea is that there is no love. No essential love. You have to make it. You have to create it. Um, in Hamlet, there is no opportunity for it. Um, so, so um, in in Freudian terms, Hamlet is uh, a boy who did not grow up enough. In that sense, um, he um, he did not overcome. He could did not mature as a young man. It would have been so easy for him to reject the ghost. He said, remember me, which means if he were a mature, healthy young man, he would say, no, thank you. I, I have other things to do. Uh, Ophelia, let's go, uh, let's go play. Let's embrace, let's kiss. What is your opinion about Ernest Jones' essay? Ernest Jones, do you agree with what Ernest Jones says? He's basically saying this particular idea, right? Yeah, this he's building up uh, this claim about uh, recognizing his Oedipal violence 
uh, in himself, which uh, paralyzes him into killing uh, Claudius. Because what Claudius did to his brother, Hamlet wanted to do to his own father. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but uh, that 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 is a valid point. And uh, to build, if you build on that, you can see that it is a crisis of love. In fact, Wilson Knight, Wilson Knight's essay comes closer to this view that uh, uh, the the metaphysic. Shakespearean metaphysic. Shakespearean metaphysic is that uh, we have a uh, disgust for ourselves because of our awareness of what we are capable of. Um, just look at Othello, Macbeth, etc. Uh, and and uh, Wilson Knight also relates that to, to the terror of love. Um, it's, a, it, it's a flip side of the coin, that same coin. Love, uh, hatred, self-hatred, and the evil, metaphysical evil, or, or the mystery of human evil, uh, or human capability to do terrible things um, that frustrates him so so that that I can live with I can see that idea so <clears throat> we had two more topics the metaphysical voids and the improvisation of power yes and uh, then the, the metaphysical voids and also the improvisation of power in Othello that's one of the questions yeah it is a um, that essay is a very sophisticated, complicated argument. The basic argument is the, which is part of my claim that it is during the Renaissance, an educated, even an educated individual for the first time began to feel that the self, uh, the individual has any value. Um, in India, until the turn of the 20th century, I bet if you are not a sovereign, you did not have a, any right to think of a value for you. If you have to keep a distance, if you cannot go to a temple, you cannot touch, uh, etc. Uh, so, so the argument was that in the Renaissance, uh, they were able to fashion themselves. But do you remember my other detail that uh, there was a kind of rat race among the educated, the knights like the, you know, Wyatt and Surrey and Sydney, and all, you know, jostling for power, and 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 being subdued by power, the power politics, and playing by that rule. Um, so the so there is an accusation that Shakespeare played by that power, played by their rule, whereas Marlowe did not, Thomas More did not, etc. Uh, why I did, etc. Uh, so, in in Desdemona, Greenblood sees whatever happens to Desdemona. That was hap what happened to every every self that tried to fashion. You know that was not very good. Uh, so it was a rude awakening. That I said very serious, very detailed analysis. Um, and, and, and so, so the title gives you the clue, improvisation 
of power. You, you, you try to survive in a terrible situation. This is actually a consequence of the new nationalism. Um, and then slowly democracy will have to develop. That is what you're going to see in the Enlightenment era. These are two terms I have not been able to understand. One is improvisation and the other is self-fashioning. Self-fashioning, um, the same idea that uh, you have the ability to educate yourself and become become a, a respected individual by your own work, um, by writing sonnet, by sacredly loving uh, beauty in its uh, essential ideal, <coughs> by thinking, thinking prohibited thoughts, forbidden pursuing forbidden knowledge. So, uh, so self-fashioning is the claim that you could be that. And in chapter six, Greenblatt is saying that it was not that easy. It was also submission. And in, in the story of Desdemona, you saw that, what happened to her. And, and the, so you were all Desdemona. If you tried to fashion yourself completely, it was, uh, in a way, not possible. Uh, so self-fashioning would become possible only with the democracy, with uh, Thomas Hobbes and, and Locke and Kant and others. Uh, but there was an awareness of it. He said that uh, Faustus was self-fashioning, fashioning himself. He was... Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Faustus, I would, I would say Faustus is the first chemist first astronomer, first real astronomer before there was a serious science. And uh, so it was misunderstood. So Faustus was misunderstood. Um, and so the final moment of the torture and suffering in some theaters, when they show it, they, they show it in a heroic way. So, so he was not a villain. One last question, sir, before we go to the next question. Do you think knowledge is to be forbidden? Forbidden knowledge? Um, because the knowledge is frightening. Um, but uh, the powers, the power tries to forbid it. Right? So in the biblical story, why was it forbidden? Two things were forbidden, right? The tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Uh, before Adam and Eve could eat from the tree of life, they were kicked out. So what is tree of life? Tree of life is immortality. Uh, so what is forbidden knowledge? Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, none of these is a new idea. You see variations of the same struggle in classical literature, in the Bible, and English literature. Um, and this is the, the forbidden knowledge is actually the awareness that we will die and we are mortal. And, and that's what uh, they figure out. Uh, so, do you... I, I have no idea whether uh, what all I have been saying was useful. Um, yes, very useful, sir. Yes. Um, 
if anybody has a question just email me i have written notes about a lot of these topics um i can send a copy of it or more articles to read um are the students asking any questions Sir, if you have some doubts, we shall email you. We oh, please, please, please. Okay, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, your your professors would have my email address, so feel free to mail. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Sir, it was in fact you know a nice journey because beginning from Chiovari, Picodella, Mirandola, and covering all the aspects of Renaissance, it was like a journey back into the Renaissance period. In fact, and uh, we have you know a different outlook or a different we uh, we gain a different perspective about uh, various authors whom we were uh, we were dealing uh, in detail. So it was like a a uh, thought giving or a point to think more and more it was really interesting sir thank you so much for being with us and i heard that you would like to meet our head of the department ms anju worki she is here yes. with us and she want to converse with you sir right now. okay thank you Oh, hello, Professor Worki. How are you? I'm fine, sir. Thank you. Nice to meet you, sir. So, what should what should I do for the enlightenment lecture? Uh, sir, I think we have two more sessions, so uh, we can take classes on uh, the license of the time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, and. Uh, uh thank you for having me sir on behalf of the department of english let me express my sincere gratitude for the great experience sir thank you so much uh, dr thomas falakin sir thank you thank you very much uh, let, and good night let me extend my thank you let me extend my gratitude to our dear rosana uh, jose yeah. the coordinator teachers students for their cooperation and support thank you so much thank you very much and good night sir sir so you will be back on next wednesday right sir we will be meeting you on next wednesday uh yes i yeah i have not prepared anything so let me know whether i can change anything in um, i look at this syllabus and uh, gather together some ideas Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Bye we now. have one more question from uh, Rosanna, ma'am. Yes. Hello. <laughs> How are you, Rosanna, miss? Thank you. Thank you for uh, asking the question. <laughs> you haven't heard the same thing about metaphysical points. Metaphysical uh, points. You know, uh, they are. Uh, they most of them are part of. the reformation they are part of the new era in which a church that was free from rome uh, charts its own path uh, of course reformation was uh, an effort to free themselves from religion uh, but they would go on to create uh new religious structures uh and but their their thunder was was stolen by calvin um so calvin movement changed uh, uh the the trajectory of the renaissance and reformation in uh, in somewhat violent way um and uh, and i'll probably talk about some of them in the enlightenment discussion 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.